Listeners, readers, welcome to the Fox page where we dive deep into the very best books. You'll come away with a richer understanding of the text at hand, all while learning to read everything a little better. I'm Kimberly Ford, one-time adjunct professor at Berkeley, best-selling author and PhD in literature. I cannot wait today to dive into what I think is basically a perfect novel. I know that I said that about Cassandra at the Wedding by Dorothy Baker, and I honestly stand by that, but I will also say that Margaret Kennedy's The Feast is unbelievably great. Like, I just haven't read a book this long. <laughs> I haven't read a book this good in so, so long. It's incredible. I can't wait to dive in. But before I do, two quick tiny things. One is if you have not checked out the Fox page Instagram, you should, partly because there's a lot of just like good content on there, but also because there are periodic uh, weekend giveaways where I, um, you know, you just have to make some sort of a comment on some sort of post and then I choose someone at random, lots of integrity in the uh, drawing, and then I send to you some sort of care package. Often there's a book, um, but there can be all sorts of different things, maybe some chocolate, um, so check out the Fox page on Instagram. Also, um, if you are looking for a little more immersive Fox page experience, you should look at the YouTube channel. So um, there you can see the way that I sometimes coordinate my outfits with whatever book we're reading. And often I will be wearing some sort of home knit item. Um, the outfit that I'm wearing today is not coordinated with the book. And in fact, it is not homemade, but actually wait, it's partially homemade. It's a, um, it's just like a V-neck sweater, but I will say it used to have two sleeves and one of our dogs took it outside and chewed one of the sleeves off and I love this sweater. So I just chopped both off. So now I have what is essentially a uh, t-shirt. It's like a, it's like a, like a knit t-shirt. So um, check out both the Fox page, Instagram and the YouTube channel. Okay, now down to the business of the day. I have already uh, tipped my hand a little and told you why I think you should read The Feast, which is essentially that it is a perfect novel. It is funny, it is dark, it's gorgeous, it is so insightful, but honestly, it is a, um, it's just an absolute feat of all sorts of literary uh, prowess and engineering. It is just unbelievable. Today, uh, for those of you who like an agenda, we are basically gonna skip over the bio of Margaret Kennedy because I did not, in fact, do a lot of work on that. I was so excited to sit down and talk to you all about this that I, I basically forgot, but we'll, we'll talk a quick bit about Margaret Kennedy. We will then dive into the text. We'll talk about the title. We'll talk about the cover art. We'll talk about this incredible McNally Jackson edition that has just come out. McNally Jackson being an imprint and also a bookstore that I really love in New York City. Then we're going to talk about the incredible structure of this book. It is unbelievable. And the structure is really important in terms of making the book feel really urgent um, and, and just really incredible. We will then talk about the narrative stance. Margaret Kennedy does so many things so well, and one of the things that's most incredible about the novel is this very nimble, very skilled narrator. We're then going to talk about intrigue. This is a book that's actually very plot heavy, and those of you who've listened to the Fox page for a long time know that I generally am not that interested in plot. This is an exception. The plot is so, so well done and it's a very important driver in terms of what I think makes the book so successful. But not only is there this big sort of important plot device that we find out right from the very beginning, but Kennedy does this amazing job of weaving intrigue throughout the entire book in a way that makes it practically unput downable. There's also this incredible character arc that happens for so many different characters. We have this very broad cast of people and it's a very, it's an ingenious plot because um, there's sort of an adage in, uh, in writing classes that it's a very good idea to get a lot of people and kind of squash them into a place and, and not let them uh, go away. So you have this idea of all of these people having convened at this summer house in uh, Cornwall where things are about to go terribly terribly wrong. So the interesting thing about that is all of these, this broad cast of characters, each of them has their own personal arc and their own personal evolution that is just incredibly, incredibly well done. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and dive on in. 
So Margaret Kennedy, um, I'm really just like reading all of this from the back of my incredible um, McNally Jackson edition here. She was born in 1896 and died in 1967. So, um, you know, she, she was alive during the first half of the 20th century, obviously, and was very much impacted by those two wars, the First and Second World Wars. And the uh, presence of the wars is really tangible in the novel and really important to keep in mind as you are reading. Uh, she found popular acclaim before the age of 30 with her 1924 novel, The Constant Nymph. It sold copies in the millions and spawned no fewer than three screen adaptations. I'm very excited to say that I have not, in fact, read The Constant Nymph, and I'm really looking forward to it. So um, she's an incredible, incredible prose stylist. That book had a lot of success. And then later in 1950, she goes on to publish The Feast, which is just unbelievably great. So um, I've talked a bit about how much I love my McNally Jackson uh, edition of this book. I love the cover art. I love how serene it looks when, uh, in fact, what is happening in this book is not at all serene. I also love, if you look a little more carefully, you know, you have all these tiny people here and you have these two people on a cliff. So you really have this presence of, of the cliff itself. I just, I love everything about it. The palette, the font, uh, the simplicity, everything is very appealing. All of the McNally Jackson books also have these French flaps, which I, I'm just, a, I'm a sucker. I'm a sucker for the French flaps. And this one in fact has what is a very, very beautiful pink um, on the inside of, of those French flaps. So The Feast is published in 1950. And it's important to remember that as you are reading because in fact, um, we really it really does emphasize the presence of the Second World War. So I really love the title of this book. It is um, on some level kind of an important plot point. We begin with this notion of the feast. Um, you know, if you are here listening to the Fox page in order to become, you know, a better reader, then um, the easiest thing to do in order to get the most out of what you're reading is simply to pay attention. So you want to spend some time thinking about the title. In this case, the title, um, it, it's, it seems fairly simple, and yet it's this kind of grand idea, and we begin with it, and there are a lot of connotations that come along with the idea of the feast. First of all, there's kind of like a menacing thing that um, once you have read the book, you hear a little bit more clearly, you know, the menace in the title. But the idea of feasting on something, the idea of a feast as being kind of slightly out of control, the idea of, you know, eating something um, in a way that's kind of gluttonous, um, and, and this idea of excess. So all of that is in the title, um, although maybe you aren't getting that at first blush. It is a title that comes up again and again. So there are several different allusions to the idea of this feast. And then the feast, in fact, comes to fruition at the very end of the novel in a very important sort of plot device uh, th that's very significant at the end. So the young girls who are really invested in the feast are these three girls named the Coves. And so you have all of this sympathy for them. And there's this sort of goodwill that is building throughout the book, despite crazy menace. There is a lot of menace in these pages, which we're about to get to. Um, but but we have this overall idea of this feast as this culminating event uh, that is both very joyful and also uh, a moment of incredible, like crazy violence uh, that, that, that occurs at the very end of the book. You guys know that I like to take the dedication and do a bunch of sleuthing, and I did do that, and I was not able to come up with a lot of information about Margot Street. This is the woman the book is dedicated to. The um, closest thing I could come to find is that Julian Street is someone with whom Margaret Kennedy had a very robust uh, correspondence about literature. My assumption, um, which may be a very bad assumption, is that Margot Street, maybe Margaret Street, I really Googled a lot of this stuff, um, is in fact uh, someone who is related somehow to Julian Street and that maybe they were a couple or a brother-sister pair that Margaret knew well. I wish I knew more. I wish I could report more to you. Um, but believe me, there is so much amazing stuff to cover in this book that I don't want to spend too much time on the dedication. So now we are diving in to the text itself. 
So we begin with the prologue. When we are talking about this text, it's impossible not to talk about the incredible structure that Margaret Kennedy has developed here. So we begin with a prologue, which in fact turns out to be a framing device. So if you're a careful reader, always read the prologue, at least make sure that it is not, I mean, you may have thought that this was like a note from the author and skipped it. If you did, you were doing yourself a major disservice. This is a prologue that is very important. So we're gonna um, look at it. It's a framing device in the sense that it sets up um, something that is kind of not particularly related to the entire contents of the novel. It's sort of outside the action of the novel. A very famous example is The Scarlet Letter um, by Nathaniel Hawthorne, where this, um, you know, you have this note at the beginning where this guy has found this manuscript up in the attic of a meeting house, I think, maybe. Um, and oftentimes it will be used to add like verisimilitude or credibility to a book. It's sort of like, this is a fiction, you know, a piece of fiction that I'm going, um, you know, that the author is writing, but they make it sound like it is something um, th that's factual because in fact, this, this character has come across information uh, that, that, that is real because it has been, you know, found in, in some attic. Frankenstein is another great example of this where uh, we have someone um, sitting down and telling the story. We have Dr. Frankenstein, in fact, sitting down and telling the story to a third party and lots of times um, it, it allows somebody to get a lot of information across and for someone to ask questions and for there to be sort of an objective bystander to whom the story is told. In this case, it's much more sly because everything that Margaret Kennedy does is so skilled and so sly and so um, nuanced and incredible. So we have um, in our prologue, in our framing device, we have the following. So... Um, we're gonna we're gonna dive on in, but one thing. Um, so we have prologue, and then we literally the first line is the funeral sermon. So we've gone from the very start. You know, this is like the prologue is even like before the start, and we are right into this funeral. So in fact, we are going to a funeral that occurs at the end of the novel. Uh, but it's so ingenious and it's so bold that Kennedy is beginning with this idea of, of this funeral and we learn very quickly uh, what it is all about. So we have these opening lines. In September 1947, the Reverend Gerald Sudden of St. Frieswide Roxton paid his annual visit to the Reverend Samuel Bott of St. Sodi, North Cornwall. They are old friends, and this holiday together is the greatest pleasure they know. So, wow. I mean, there is so, so much that I can say. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but it is such a, like a bold and incredible opening. We have these two gentlemen, and interestingly, Gerald Sudden is actually very close to the name of Jerry Siddle, who is the eldest boy um, of the family whose house uh, has been turned into the hotel that we are going to find out about in just a minute. So there are lots of echoes throughout the book of names that seem to sort of repeat themselves. And it's very significant in many ways because um, I think what, what Kennedy is trying to convey there is this idea that people seem very different. You know, th this uh, this reverend is very different from Jerry Siddall, who's a doctor, uh, who's a young man who is considering whether or not he should go to Africa. Um, I mean, that doesn't make them sound that, that different, but they're pretty different. And yet their names are the same because I think we are meant to believe that people are, um, you know, more similar than we think they are. So we have these two religious men getting together. Religion is extremely important throughout the novel. We have this kind of bookend thing where at the end, um, Margaret Kennedy talks about this kind of act of God that occurs, which is, of course, the cliff falling onto the house uh, that, that it has become this hotel. Um, but so, so, and there's a lot of debate throughout the book. You know, there are some characters who are Anglo-Catholic and some um, who seem to be more sort of high church and some who are Presbyterian. And it's, it's somewhat subtle. It's not a huge, um, you know, sort of vein moving through the work, but it is in fact a presence. So we have these two men 
introduced um, in September 1947. Again, it's very important to recognize that uh, the book came out in 1950, but it is set in 1947 in Cornwall. So you have this idea of, of really um, still, you know, feeling the reverberations of the Second and the First World Wars. So we, we have um, th this, this uh, introduction to them. And then it's very interesting to me that she has in the present tense, they are old friends and this holiday together is the greatest pleasure they know. Which is so, I mean, it's so beautiful that she puts it in the present tense. I'm usually not a big fan of that. I like, um, if, some, if a story is going to be told in the past, I like it to all be told in the past. And sometimes the present tense can feel sort of gimmicky. But when it's used well, it can make things feel much more immediate. And there is something very nice about the relationship between these men feeling very immediate. It's also, though, so sad. So Margaret Kennedy has provided so much pathos and so much tension and so much melancholy throughout these pages. I mean, honestly, there's so much that it should be a drag, but it's also hilarious. But it's this incredible mix between, um, between pathos and, and just this absolute hilarity. But the fact that this vacation, this holiday together is the greatest pleasure they know is so sad. I mean, you're talking about lives that, that, that are very small on some level and very sort of diminished if this is in fact their greatest pleasure. Part of the reason I say that is because, you know, the highlight of their evening was going to be chess and you don't get a sense of these men as being particularly close. So the fact that this is, you know, their big highlight of, of their lives um, is really very kind of sad and very small on some level. But very quickly, so that is page uh, three. On page four, we have the one um, reverend is saying to the other man of the cloth. I don't know what he's calling himself. There are lots of different names. There's canons and pastors and all these different names that come up throughout the book. Um, but we have this very important piece of information that is given to us uh, on page four. During the month of August, a huge mass of cliffside had suddenly subsided. It had fallen into a small cove a couple of miles from St. Sodi village and obliterated a house which had once stood on a spit of land on the east side of the cove. Every person inside the house had perished. I mean, this is such a bombshell. And this is this plot that I was alluding to. So we find out, in fact, that this uh, reverend is meant to write a funeral sermon, which is the title of this section, for people who have perished in this house. So we have this very sort of matter-of-fact way that we are given this information, and it's very skillful. In fact, it is the visiting pastor who is kind of remembering the facts of it because he read them in the newspaper. Um, but what I love about this is the word obliterated. So we have obliterated is this kind of, like there's something kind of um, funny and awkward and strange about that word that I really love in this context. So there is always in Margaret Kennedy this nice kind of like winky kind of like, um, it's not that she's like taking joy in someone else's misfortune, but there is this sense of the absurdity and of things always is, um, you know, sort of a gallows humor type of thing, a sort of dark humor that is threaded throughout the entire novel. And for some reason, that word obliterated was one of the things that really sort of clued me into this kind of perverse sense of humor that she has that, of course, I, I love. So at the end of the prologue in the discussion between these um, these two pastor type people, we in fact realize that, um, that there are survivors and we have this incredible um, tension that is ratcheting up even further because in fact we find out that there are survivors and right away you're like, oh my gosh, wait. And in fact, their interaction with Father Bot was such um, that, that the tension rises even further. So at the end of the prologue, uh, he says the following. Were there survivors? Oh yes, they came here and they talked. They sat here talking all night. You know how people talk when they've had a shock. They say things they wouldn't say at any other time. They said the most astonishing things. They told me how they had escaped. They told me a great deal too much. I wish they hadn't. How did they escape? I don't know what to say about it at all, said Bot, turning from the window. I'm not sure what I think. They told a lot, but of course they didn't tell everything. Nobody will ever know the whole truth. But what they did tell me... He came to the fireplace and took a chair opposite Sudden. Now listen, he said. See what you make of it. It's so amazing. It's so, so good. So... 
not only do we have this sense of like, oh my gosh, this whole house was obliterated, but then we also have this sense of like, there's some survivors and not only are there survivors, but these people said astonishing things. Like literally the word is astonishing. So you have this sense of, of really wanting to hear what it is that this this priest, or not priest, but this, this like pastor guy has to say. Um, it's just an absolutely amazing way to set this up. And then um, Margaret Kennedy goes one step further, which I'm very happy. You you get a sense from the end of the prologue that maybe like it's just going to be this one guy telling the story. And thankfully, it is not. Thankfully, we have this structure in this book that is incredible that allows um, for much more texture and much more nuance and, and much more breadth and depth in the novel than if it were simply being told by Father Bott. Okay, so... We're going to dive in, in fact, to that structure. So we have this framing device where we have these two pastors who are having this conversation and we learn this very important information that the house has been obliterated and everyone uh, who was in the house perished, but we have these survivors. So that is such an incredibly sort of potent way to drive us forward. I mean, we are really, really curious about who is going to survive. So we go from this prologue to uh, the word Saturday. And on some level, that's kind of this nice um, grounding force. So this, presumably these gentlemen are getting together on a Saturday because he's talking about having to deliver the sermon the next day. And, um, but then we're going back a week to the Saturday before the cliff obliterated the house and the people perished. So we're going back to the Saturday before, and we do have this very nice chronological structure that's really grounding and very helpful for the reader because um, there is a lot, again, a lot of depth and breadth and a lot of uh, texture and a lot of different elements to the structure, but we do have this very nice chronology. Um, we know we're going to move, you know, Saturday through the following Friday. So the structure, uh, the way to best describe it, I think, is this idea of collage. So we have all of these different elements throughout. We have letters, we have sermons, we have hymns, we have some ciphers. We at one point get the covenant of the Spartans, which is like the little gang that the kids have put together and they're made to do all of these terrible initiations. We have excerpts of diaries. Um, we, and then we have just sort of straightforward third person narration. But it is so incredibly well done. So as we are diving into the prose here and looking at this structure, um, we're gonna we're gonna look at a few different examples of these few different textual elements that she is bringing uh, to bear, and in fact that add a lot of texture to uh, to the novel itself. So the very first thing, um, it's numbered, which is also nice. I think there's a grounding force behind the chronology um, and also these numbers that we have. Um, Margaret Kennedy is a master of so, so many things, but one thing that she does incredibly well here are uh, the section titles. I'm famous actually for uh, not reading the section titles, and I am, I'm gonna tell you that I was guilty of doing it even here, even when they were so good and so astute and funny and telling. Um, but uh, on my rereading, and this is now my re-re-reading, uh, I am I'm really, uh, really absorbing and appreciating the strength of these uh, section titles. So we begin with one that is called Letter from Lady Gifford to Mrs. Siddall. I don't know why I'm holding the book up. If you're on um, the, the if you're uh, on the YouTube channel, you can see I'm holding this book up as if you were like a bunch of kindergartners and I'm reading. Although it is actually kind of helpful. You can't read it, of course, but you can see uh, the structure here. So we have the title and then we have like the old house, Queen's Walk, Chelsea. So we have basically an address. It looks kind of like a business letter. And then we have the date. August 13th, 1947. So once again, we are being reminded, um, you know, if the Second World War was, uh, what, 1940 to 1944, um, the, then, you know, we're really very close to the end of, the, of that war. Um, Dear Mrs. Siddle, so we know that Mrs. Siddle is one of the owners of the hotel. I ought to have written before to tell you how much we are all looking forward to our holiday at Pendazac. But I wasn't very well in the spring when my husband booked the rooms and letter writing was forbidden. Much better now. Doctors, sharpening their knives, have promised to make me perfectly well in the autumn. This is so 
incredible to me. So here we have Lady Gifford, um, who is obviously a lady. You know, she's like some sort of landed gentry type, you know, hootsie, tootsie. That is not the word. Like, um, you know, she's like, whatever. She's very fancy. Uh, and she is married to this guy, this long suffering, um, you know, Sir Henry Gifford, and they have four children. But right from the very start, we have so much information about her. It's subtle, but it's incredibly well done. So first of all, there are a bunch of italics in her section, which is so good because we are really hearing her voice. So this is an epistolary moment here. Epistolary simply means that it's a letter. Um, there are entire novels that are epistolary novels. It's not really my favorite genre. Um, a very important uh, example is uh, Dangerous Liaisons by Laclau. I think that's even from like the 18th century or something. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's to me, it can be limiting because you have, you know, two people corresponding. And so really the only perspectives you're getting are these two people and they're only telling, um, you know, they're only saying things to each other. It's like very limited, the perspective. But because she has these letters interspersed with all of these other types of, of sort of collage, all these other pieces of information, it in fact is very telling and the letters themselves are very telling. We do get to hear the first person um, narration on the part of these people, which is very satisfying. So not only are we getting this sense here, um, you know, we know that she was not very well. Uh, we, in fact, she was sort of enough of an invalid, which is kind of her persona, that her husband had to do all of these different things for her. You know, it sounds like a Victorian rest cure. You know, she's someone who is, um, is very entitled, we're about to find out, but also someone um, who is, is very demanding, and she goes on to be demanding. But there is this incredible line here, doctors sharpening their knives have promised to make me perfectly well in the autumn. So doctors sharpening their knives is just the first of all of these different instances of menace that we have throughout this incredible novel. So not only do we have the intrigue of like who is going to perish when the house is obliterated, but we also have this like crazy amount of menace and, and sort of dread and all these terrible things that are happening um, th that are really, really powerful and that are sort of these like one-offs that you hear throughout. It's very subtle like this, just kind of thrown in, you know, a, a sort of seemingly random, but in fact really ratchets up the tension. So we have um, this letter from her. And then in fact, on the very next page, we have, um, she, she has in this kind of, um, in a very like outlined kind of list form, she has all of these requirements that she is making of this hotel owner. So not only do we have her letter, but we also have this list that's totally absurd and demanding. And she acts like, you know, she's going to be so easy to take care of, but in fact, uh, she's really making big demands. So then the next um, sort of letter that we come across here, the first is from Lady Gifford, and our second, um, our second section is in fact another letter, but here um, I think that, that Kennedy is also sort of tipping her hand here toward the kind of levity. You know, she's really indicating um, a lot with this next, uh, next title. It says, unfinished letter from Miss Dorothy Ellis to Miss Gertrude Hill. The fact that it's unfinished is so funny to me. I literally wrote, ha, huh, because there, there's this kind of idea that that really a lot, like we, Margaret Kennedy is going to let it all hang out here. I mean, it doesn't sound like that revealing, but it's so telling. It turns out Miss Ellis is a housekeeper and the fact that she, um, you know, is unable to even finish a letter is like, it, you know, she has this whole thing about being so put upon and her life is so difficult when in fact she does none of the work and leaves all of the work to um, her very young colleague, Nancy Bell Thomas. So we have this unfinished letter and then it is this gossipy letter between a, a Miss Ellis, Miss Dorothy Ellis and Miss Gertrude Hill. So you have these two women, we know just even from their names that they're kind of spinster types. It ends up being this very sort of gossipy kind of mean spirited letter, but we are learning so, so much about Miss Ellis who is in fact an important character throughout the novel. So the, the points that I'm making here are that we are hearing so much about these people because we are hearing letters that are intimate letters in this case, an intimate letter to a friend. And we are having the sort of first person uh, voice of these people uh, in a way that is very revealing and telling. 
So we do also find out that Miss Ellis is a total snoop. And later she um, sort of stops reading the diary of one of the guests. Again, she's the housekeeper. Um, and But, but um, that's much later. But we also hear at the end of her letter have the third sort of chunk of text, which is extract from the diary of Mr. Paley. So um, we have this, this, now we're shifting and we're becoming even more intimate, which is the idea of this diary. So again, we have the date, Penn de Zach, Saturday, August 16th. So, and then he goes on and talks a little bit about seeing Nancy Bell arriving. And then we have this, this, um, this really good example of how different Mr. Paley's tone is. He's, he's been waiting up all morning. It's like, you know, early morning and he's writing in his diary. When Christina wakes, I shall no longer be alone. She will not ask why I have been sitting here half the night. She no longer asks me questions, no longer cares to know how it is with me. She passes her life at my side in silence. It is no doubt a wretched life, but I cannot help her. So many of these people who we are being introduced to early on in the book are really at a low ebb, no pun intended, given that all of this is happening um, at the seashore. But there are people who are really um, in a lot of pain. I mean, Miss uh, Gifford, I mean, not, not Miss, Lady Gifford is actually like in the least amount of pain. She's claiming to be an invalid. Uh, but, but you have all of these people who are having, um, they're, they're very uh, upfront about the difficulties that they're having. With Mr. Paley, we understand that he and his wife, Christina, and they spend all day long together um, out on this cliff, we find out. But he and his wife, Christina, we find are, are, are um, you know, sort of spending all their time together, but never converse. And they have this very, very heavy um, reality and this very sort of bleak existence. We are very curious. In fact, this is an, a, an example of the intrigue that we're going to talk about soon. This idea of, of, uh, of, of what it is, like what is it that has made them so sad? You definitely have this sense of their lives as being wretched because of a certain reason. And in fact, that reason is revealed not too much uh, into the future. So we have first, you know, frivolous and silly and demanding Miss Gifford, then we, Miss Lady Gifford, then we have um, Miss Ellis writing her letter, then we have the diary of Mr. Paley, and finally, we are um, on, you know, section four here, page 17, you know, we're only 14 pages into this book, um, we have a section called One Pair of Hands, and this is the first instantiation of this third person narrator that is so, so skilled. So again, um, an amazing uh, uh, section title here, the idea of one pair of hands. There's something about one pair, one being singular, obviously, and then two being, I mean, pair being about two. We find out very quickly, uh, this section is about Nancy Bell, and we find out, in fact, that she would like to be a pair, um, and, and that she is, um, she's having some trouble, and yet she is by herself. She is she is someone who is, is very lonely uh, and very sad at the beginning of, of the book when we very first meet her. There's also this idea of, um, of, of hand, like asking for someone's hand. There's this idea of marriage, very, very subtle. But also the idea of one pair of hands, um, you, know, it, it, you know, the idea of many hands making light work. Uh, we find out that Nancy Bell works with Miss Ellis. And again, Miss Ellis does nothing. And Nancy Bell with her one pair of hands is essentially keeping the entire place running. We have uh, the following description of Nancy Bell when she is getting, she's coming toward the house. As soon as she came within sight of the house, her spirits sank. They sank lower with every step she took, as though she were walking into a fog of misery and depression. And every day she felt a greater reluctance to go on. She could not tell why this should be, for the work at Pendazac was not hard or disagreeable and everyone treated her well. She did not like Miss Ellis, but life at the ATS had taught her how to get on with all sorts of people, including those whom she disliked. Miss Ellis could scarcely be responsible for this aversion which assailed her whenever she approached the house, this feeling that something dreadful, something indescribably sad, was happening there. 
I mean, talk about intrigue ratcheting up. You have this sense of the house as really, as, as something, I mean, she literally says indescribably sad. So she then, you know, she's wondering if she's kind of projecting her own sadness onto the place and wondering if it has to do with terrible Miss Ellis. She makes reference to the ATS. I actually don't know what that is, um, and I did not research it, but we have to assume that that's some kind of war work that she did. Um, again, everyone uh, has been changed by the war. In fact, um, later she talks about how she used to love being uh, at the Cove, and she used to go down and play where this house is um, and bring messages there from her father's cottage. And now we know that she lives only with her mother. So we have to assume that her father was killed in, in one of the wars. So you have this sense of everyone as having um, made it through something very difficult. But again, uh, she is at low ebb certainly here. So we have looked here at um, a couple of the different ways that Kennedy is making this collage out of letters, out of sermons, out of hymns, um, out of lists. And then, of course, we have like this connective tissue, which is all of this third person narration, as with this Nancy Bell part that is describing essentially what the different people in the house are doing. So um, here at the Fox page, in order to become uh, readers who read more richly, it's always important to ask, so what? So, you know, if you identify that something is a symbol of something, or if you are looking at characterization or great dialogue or um, looking at any aspect of a novel carefully, it's important to identify the thing and then to ask, so what? What is it that the, the, the writer is doing here? And this kind of collage structure that Kennedy is offering is um, it's it's doing so much. So this question of so what is answered in the most um, you know satisfying way. One thing she's doing is adding breadth. So we have all of these different people. I mean, just in the first few pages, we have become very intimate with Lady Gifford, with Miss Ellis, uh, with Nancy Bell Thomas. So we've Mr. Paley sad Mr. Paley. I mean, we really are, are getting a lot of people covered. But in addition to this breadth of characters, we also have an incredible amount of depth because we are hearing their voices, whether that's in a letter, whether it's in dialogue, um, whether it's the actions that they are taking, whether it's their inner thoughts. Um, we're really getting to know these people very intimately. So we have both breadth and we have depth. We also have this incredible verisimilitude. So verisimilitude is just a fancy word for like when a fiction feels real. So you have this real sense of like veracity, like it's it's true, it feels very true in lots of ways. So I think we have a lot of verisimilitude because she's assembling this broad cast of characters and because we have this structure where we're seeing each of them in their own lives with lots of detail and, and uh, dialogue and uh, all sorts of different kind of ephemera, then we have this real sense of, of getting to know them and, and really sort of trusting that their world is, is like, quote unquote, real. Um, there's also a lot of credibility in the sense that um, like things are being sort of cross-checked. You know, you're, you'll see, um, you know, something will happen from one person's perspective and then you'll see it from another. And so there's this consistency that allows us to feel a real credibility on the part of Margaret Kennedy. We also have this uh, just amazing, amazing example throughout the entire novel of dramatic irony. So dramatic irony is just another fancy word that means when um, the, the reader essentially has information that the people in the fictive work don't have. So for example, we know, I mean, this is the biggest example of, of dramatic irony. We know that at the end of this week, that this cliff is going to fall onto this you know house and everyone inside the house is going to perish so that's kind of the biggest example of dramatic irony but it is all throughout in these incredibly subtle incredibly telling interesting ways so we for example we know how nancy bell thomas is feeling about things we know how mr paley is feeling about his wife christina we know what um you know lady gifford's expectations are so then when when the um, plot sort of evolves and when the narrative moves forward we're gonna know whether or not these people are feeling disappointed uh and, and we will have a lot more information than the characters themselves actually have. So one of the things that I think that uh, that she does so, so well is this incredible amount of insight. So again, we have this idea of, of Mr. Paley, for example, really understanding that his wife's 
like her whole life is just miserable. We don't know why, but and he understands that he can't really help her. But there is this sense of of people being very, very insightful. I mean, as Nancy Bell is walking toward work, she's really doing a lot of 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 sort of heavy lifting to try to figure out what it is that feels so ominous. So there, there's this real um, insight that characters have, and also that we are getting uh, just from this third person narrator. There's a lot of times when Margaret Kennedy will just name things in ways that could feel heavy handed, except that her word choice is so just like original and interesting and unexpected. And you, you, you end up with these like really important pieces of information or insights um, into the characters or into the actions, partially because she's naming them, but also because we have all of these different uh, pieces of information that have come from all of these different uh, sources. So with a structure that is this complex and this rich and this full of texture, you can imagine that the reader might feel um, a little unmoored or, uh, you know, a little lost at times. And one of the reasons why I think that that does not happen uh, is because there's this incredibly deft narrative voice. So we saw a little bit of, um, of this voice. It's very changeable, obviously, because if it's Lady Gifford's voice, it's one voice. And if it's Mr. Paley's, it's entirely different. Um, but when we have the, the sort of third person omniscient, uh, omnipotent, because it is also the, the, the voice of Margaret Kennedy, who is writing the whole thing, she has power over the whole thing. Um, but it is this omniscient kind of all knowing narrator that is incredibly skilled because it is sometimes pulled way back, giving us these beautiful broad vistas, and at other times is really, really close to a character, as with Nancy Bell, when she's trying to sort of suss out this terrible feeling that she is having about, uh, about the house. So I'd like to begin um, this discussion of this incredible narrative voice with an example of the narrator being very, very pulled back, very far away. So this is on um, page 59. So we're, you know, a little, uh, a little ways into this book. And the section title is Good People Come and Pray. I'm going to need my glasses. Pendazac Church Town stands in the bare upland fields on the top of the cliff. It consists of seven cottages, a post office, and a public house, crouching in a fuzz of trees beneath an enormous church, the Church of St. Sodi, who came long ago out of Ireland in a stone boat with 10,000 other saints. So um, again, we have the presence here of Catholicism, we have the presence of religion in general, but, but what's important here is the idea of, of this narrator that is pulled way, way back, both in time and in geography. So imagine a, a very sweeping, sweeping kind of cinematic view of like an entire landscape, and which is essentially what we have here. We're describing this town as if from very far away. It's also really important that it stands in the shadow of this church. So in much the same way that the cliff is overshadowing the house, you have this church here, St. Sodi, um, which is overshadowing this whole town. In this case, St. Sodi, um, he is the one, he is a saint who has come over from Ireland. So again, this is a lot of this Catholicism. Um, the idea of the stone boat, I don't even really understand that so much. But to me, it like, literally makes me think of like Stonehenge and like Druids and like, you know, like pre-Christian stuff, like not even saints, but like some sort of pagan stuff from long, long, long ago, um, eons ago, maybe even. So you have this sense of, of being very, very far back in time and also a um, of, of being very far away geographically. But then we, um, by the middle of this page, we have swept in close and we are now um, reading a description of Bruce, um, who, is a, uh, who is a person who becomes a, a relatively important character. Bruce, by the way, is not coming to pray. I mean, he's like totally a heathen, this guy. Okay, again. Bruce, however, did not climb that steep hill for love of plain song or for the sake of coastal scenery or to see a man who was said to bring a donkey into the chancel on Palm Sunday. He went because he was told to do so. His mistress had a fancy to see the place and had ordered him to escort her. So we are finding out from the beginning all of this information about Bruce. I mean, first of all, he's heading into a church with his mistress. We find out, in fact, that she's much older. Her name is Anna Lachine. 
or Lachane. Um, Lachine is how it is pronounced in the Audible book. I'm gonna make a quick digression here about the Audible book. Um, I really, really liked the Audible version of this and um, I had to get over though my one big kind of quibble with it. So when I was reading, when I am reading The Feast by Margaret Kennedy, I do have like a very vaguely feminine kind of narrative voice that I'm that I'm imagining and hearing. I'm not actually hearing the voice, but like in my mind, it's kind of a woman who is telling me this story because it is in fact Margaret Kennedy who has made it up. It was a little jarring to me that in the audio version, uh, it is a man who is reading, but he ends up being so good. And he has so much skill in terms of like, when he's being Mr. Paley, it's totally different than when he's being Bruce, which is totally different than when he's being Jerry Siddall. So you have this sense of, of, um, of, of all of these different voices being very well captured by this audio version. But here we have Bruce, um, who is going into the church with his mistress. We're being very, uh, this is the first time we're introduced to him. And it's this kind of juxtaposition between like going into this holy place, but also going in as, um, you know, like the boy toy of this much older woman, Anna Lachine. That is how they say her name. Um, by the way, Le Chen, I believe Chen, I, I might be wrong about this. I think in French, it means the oak. And in fact, she has all of this hair. She has this long blonde hair that is um, that goes all the way down to her knees. And a lot is made of it being Teutonic. So there's like this weird kind of Aryan overtone that was really weird. Plus hair down to your knees is so gross, but she wears it all coiled up on her head and she's described as being sort of top heavy. I mean, this is the level of detail that you are getting with every single character. You know these people so, so well because the details are unique and interesting and telling and memorable. I mean, it is so profoundly well done. But so you have this woman and her boy toy going, I mean, I shouldn't say boy toy, her escort. I mean, literally they use the word mistress and escort. So it's very clear what we are talking about here. He's kind of a kept man. And um, she, the two of them are going into a church together. So again, we have this, this kind of wink, this kind of dark humor on the part of Margaret Kennedy. And, you know, to a certain degree, we have, we have some nice uh, irreverence. But what the, the, the um, point that I'm making here is this narrative voice uh, is able to be very far away, both geographically and in time, or it is able to sort of tell us exactly what Bruce is doing here in the church. So it can be very close to a character or it can be very far away. Okay, we're gonna look um, on page 21. So, this is a, an example kind of early on of um, Mrs. of Miss Ellis talking with Nancy Bell. Again, Miss Ellis is just kind of this terrible um, housekeeper who is giving all of the work to Nancy Bell. In this little passage, uh, Miss Ellis is, uh, she is sort of getting on Nancy Bell and like, you know, demanding that she do even more work. This ritual conversation took place every morning and its offensiveness was deliberate. The implication was that Nancy Bell lacked both the wit to remember the usual routine and the conscience to follow it without a daily reminder. It was called getting after the girl and constituted, in Miss Ellis's opinion, the major part of her duties, a task not to be undertaken for less than four pounds a week. This is so incredible. There is so much amazing stuff happening here. So again, even in the same paragraph, we have this kind of um, more distant third person narrator who is saying, this ritual conversation took place every morning. So you have this sense of repetition, this sense of kind of this all knowing narrator and its offensiveness was deliberate. So this is a very good example of our narrator really um, like naming things in a way that could feel redundant or heavy handed, but is actually kind of funny. Like to state things so boldly, this idea that the offensiveness was deliberate is really telling and I think just so charming. I find something, these bold statements being uh, as so charming. So then we are, um, you know, the implication is that Nancy Bell's not doing the work, blah, blah, blah. And then we're getting closer and closer to Miss Ellis. Uh, and in this case, it was called getting after the girl. 
and you can't see this, um, but um, getting after the girl here is, uh, it's uh, it, capitals, it's capital letters. So getting after the girl. And it's so charming and funny that it is because of course we're, we're poking fun at Miss Ellis here who has this kind of, um, you know, she's so kind of not self-aware and she's like, she does this thing called getting after the girl, um, which, which is really cruel and, and terrible, but it, it's, it's, we have to see kind of this humor in it. And then Margaret Kennedy is so skilled and so bold as to go on and say, uh, it constituted, in Miss Ellis's opinion, the major part of her duties. So that is already funny because again, this is it's it, this is the kind of dramatic irony. We know that Miss Ellis is ridiculous and that Nancy Bell's awesome. So we're, we're definitely siding with Nancy Bell, not with Miss Ellis. And then Margaret Kennedy goes one step further a task not to be undertaken for less than four pounds a week. So I love that. There's something about the specific detail there that is so charming to me. I mean, this is, um, again, verisimilitude. We're having an actual number. This is kind of the realist novel, like wanting to know what, like how many pounds are being made per week by the housekeeper. But there's also this sense of like audacity on the part of Miss Ellis that I find so um, just funny and amazing. So it makes sense um, to me to do this one last example. Part of, of when we are looking at this narrative voice is also, it's just a good example or a good time to take a really close look at the beautiful, beautiful prose. And this example um, makes sense because it's Nancy Bell and Bruce. And these are people we've, we've been talking about a little bit. We have this absolutely gorgeous passage here uh, that, that is this, again, this, this deft, um, sort of toggling of this third person narrator between like a more omniscient stance and then being really uh, very much in the interior in this case of Nancy Bell. Now she was crying as she had never cried in her life, even for Brian. That's the first time we hear the name of the fiance and you're like, oh, oh my gosh. But it's that kind of intimacy, you know, you're like, oh my gosh, wait, I both don't know things about her because I didn't even know the name of her fiance, but I also know so much about her. For she had always known that she would in time recover from the pain that Brian had caused her. But this wound had poison in it. In getting used to the idea that Bruce was a rotten bad lot, she must become a harder, colder person. So she went and sobbed among the rhododendrons, not for him, but for the aunt, not for him, but for the Nancy Bell of yesterday. It's so sad, but there's also, again, the specificity of, uh, so she went and sobbed among the rhododendrons. It's so beautiful. It's telling, it's evocative. Um, rhododendrons are, you know, such complex and big and, you know, every, every rhododendron bloom is like an entire bouquet. I mean, it's just so, so beautiful, the prose, but it's also so telling. Um, and, and so like, again, this is this kind of insight. She's not crying because Bruce is a jerk. She's crying because she is, she, she had hope and that hope is yet again being dashed. It's such, such beautiful prose. Uh, and, and largely we are able to have these beautiful insights and, uh, and this beautiful proximity, you know, entering into people's consciousness because of this very skilled narrative voice. Okay, next I want to talk about intrigue. So I, I have alluded to this before, and obviously we have this very large question of like, who is going to be in the house when it is obliterated and who is going to perish? But we also have all of these other smaller intrigues that are so well done and really, really propel the uh, narrative forward. I mean, this book is not short. It's what? It's like easily 300 pages. What is it? 324 pages. But it really just clips right along because you are so caught up in these different intrigues. Um, on page 16, we had Mr. Paley being very sad, and we are curious about why Mr. Paley is, in fact, sad. I love this part because uh, we have this reported conversation. Again, this is his diary, and he's talking about a conversation that he had with uh, the owner of the hotel. I had a talk with Siddle, our host, yesterday. He told me that Pendazac Cove used to be called Hell's Kitchen, and that his sons wished him to call the house Hell's Hotel. Since he seemed to regard this as a joke, I made shift to laugh and did not say, with Mephistopheles, why this is hell, nor am I out of it. But that line, that line haunts me wherever I am. I can never escape from it. 
So we have just learned that his wife, Christina, you know, that they're basically sort of estranged and she's miserable. And then we have this kind of funny moment because it, an incredible foreshadowing. I mean, the Pendazac Cove used to be called Hell's Kitchen. Like this place where they are, are existing is not safe. I mean, there's so much menace in every single detail. It's also really funny that his boys wanted to call it Hell's Hotel. But it's also so startling because, in fact, it does end up being that. I mean, like, literally, the whole thing gets obliterated. So, um, but but then, instead of laughing, his father, of course, thinks this is funny because Siddle is just sort of checked out and resigned and is just, you know, surprised by nothing um, and is very wry about everything. Um, but but Mr. poor Mr. Paley is in hell. Then right across the page, we have um, the ending of Mr. Paley's section. He's talking about Siddle still. He has three sons who despise him. I have no child, but I would not change places with Siddle. So there's this sense here of this child, this mention of the child. So, you know, it's not, it's, it's subtle, certainly. But if at the end of a section, of a chapter section like that, if someone's going to say, you know, I have no child, you, you need to sort of pay attention to that. And in fact, we find out fairly soon thereafter on page 58, um, it's intriguing. You know, you're like, why is he in hell? And why do he and his wife, Christina, not speak? And then on 58, we actually have that information. This is Miss Ellis, of course, talking to Nancy Bell because it turns out Miss Ellis has been snooping around uh, reading Mr. Paley's diary, among other things. So Miss Ellis is saying about, uh, about the Paley's. Well, they had this little girl and she got ill, TB, and they hadn't the cash for a sanatorium and he wouldn't let her write to her people. And she said if the child died, she'd never forgive him. And the child did die and she never has. So again, we have this real intrigue. We don't understand what is weighing so heavily upon these people. And then, you know, 40 pages later, we find out what in fact this intrigue is. Of course, that sets us up for yet another interesting question, which is like, are they going to get over it? You know, is there a way that, that this is going to become better? And um, with Nancy Bell, we have, again, that same sense of intrigue, obviously, from a different question. So um, on page 18, we find out, uh, so on page 18, just after um, we, we see her kind of trudging slowly across the sand and wondering about the house in general, she says this. She had come home with trouble in her heart and the winter had been a heavy one. But if it was me, she thought, as she dragged her feet across the sand, it would be getting better because I'm getting better. I'm getting over it. I don't think of it, but two or three times in a week now, but the house gets worse. So you have this sense of, of things um, are getting better for her and you, you're sort of hopeful. At this point, we still don't know what her trouble is. Um, she talks about her trouble. And in fact, um, she refers to it a couple of times. And I literally have here pregnant because, um, you know, when you think of a young girl or a young woman in trouble, that is often, um, and especially in this day and age, uh, in a religious kind of um, milieu, you, you have a sense that she might be pregnant. She is not, in fact, pregnant. Um, but on page uh, 26, we hear the following. So this is Mrs. Siddle, and she, this is information that she has gotten from Mrs. Thomas, Mrs. Thomas being uh, Nancy Bell's mother. According to Mrs. Thomas, there's been an unhappy love affair, and she's taken quite a time to get over it. She was engaged to some young man, had her trousseau already and everything, and he threw her over at the last minute. It seems he thought himself too good for her. So again, we have this intrigue. Um, that in the beginning, we don't know what her trouble is. We know that she's beginning to get over it, although she's really uh, feeling a lot of darkness and weight. Then we find out what it is, uh, you know, maybe 10, 15 pages later, that in fact, this, you know, her fiance has left her and thinks that he's too good for her. So we have these intrigues that don't last for too, too long, which is good because you don't want to feel manipulated as the reader. But so Margaret Kennedy is giving us the answer. She's she's sort of, um, you know, revealing what the what the sort of initial intrigue was all about. But now we have another one because, of course, um, a relationship is building between Nancy Bell and Bruce. But we are suspicious because, you know, the fiance threw Nancy Bell over because he thought that he was better. 
And there is this question with Bruce of whether or not Bruce also thinks that. Bruce is putting on airs. Bruce is also the escort um, of, of uh, Mrs. Lachine. So, uh, you know, complicated situation all the way around. But so we have these intrigues that are kind of woven through the text and, and so, so beautifully done. So not only is there this tension of the larger plot point, but we have all of these different uh, sort of intriguing questions. So just a few more of them. At one point, um, uh, Sir Gifford, Henry Gifford, talks about how a policeman came to their house looking for Lady Gifford right before they left for Pendezac. So you're like, wait, why is a policeman interested in Lady Gifford? So that's like a very large piece of intrigue that's just kind of this throwaway um, th that not much is made of. But then each time more information is revealed, you're like, oh my God, right. It's just this incredibly well done uh, situation. Then we have Jerry Siddle, who falls in love with this young girl, Evangeline, and um, who is visiting the hotel with her terrible father, who is a religious figure. Um, but this question about Jerry, who is this very kind of um, sad sack kid, there's much is made of his acne, which is so sad. He has boils, um, you know, like all over his face. Um, his, his spots, they keep talking about, um, I mean, they talk about them as boils. It's really, it's really pretty, pretty awful. Um, but Jerry, he's also a doctor and he is made to work around the hotel in order to pay for the uh, educations of his two younger brothers. So it's this terrible situation where Jerry is totally put upon, but soon you find out that because he is in this relationship with Evangeline, um, you know, he's, he, there's this question of like, is he going to be able to sell his father's law, law library and take that money and do something good with it? And is he going to take the position in Kenya that has been open for him that he's interested in? So there's a lot of intrigue in terms of what is going to happen with um, Jerry, who is fairly spineless at the beginning. A lot of, lot of intrigue there. Um, the, uh, Evangeline, who's the girl that he falls in love with, I mean, girl, she's probably 20, um, at least 20. She is the, she's one of six children who has stayed with her father because she promised that she would, uh, to her mother on her mother's deathbed. Her mother dies. She promises she'll stay with her father. But meanwhile, she is, she has this file in the glass and she is, you know, um, um, like going to poison her father. So we have this intrigue of whether or not she's going to poison her father, um, there's uh, the whole question of the black amber. There's this very valuable piece of black amber and um, it goes missing and we assume uh, that terrible Mrs. Cove has taken it. There are all sorts of different kind of uh, intrigues that are building. There's all of these different initiations that the kids are doing, um, the Spartans. You know, there's all of this sort of uh, tension that is building with all of these different intrigues throughout the book. And what is so well done is how, how deftly they are woven and how well developed they are. There's so many, and yet um, it feels just just rich. It feels rich and and um, and and sort of satisfying when it you know could in fact feel sort of overwhelming or scattered. Um, but it's just so absolutely well done. Okay, so now I want to go on to talk uh, sort of briefly about the evolution of a few of these characters. Which this is one of the things that I thought was so satisfying um, and also that added again to this high level of tension throughout the book. So. We have these intrigues, uh, but but what is happening, and we've met quite a few characters at a low ebb, uh, you know, they're not feeling that great at the beginning, and, or, you know, they're in kind of a pickle. And um, as the novel is going on, we see these incredibly satisfying arcs. So each one of the characters, not all of them, but a lot of the characters, the ones we care about particularly, um, are, are growing and changing. So there's kind of this like, um, you know, received notion, uh, this adage that, that what is most satisfying about uh, a piece of fiction is to have your character show some change. You want the character, you know, to really go through some sort of trials and tribulations and, and come out a, a different person, presumably better. Um, this is a, a notion that I have some problems with. I don't really care if there's no, uh, you know, change in uh, a character throughout the course of a novel, but it, it is something that is generally very satisfying to readers. In this case, Margaret Kennedy is giving us the evolution of so many people and they all feel so well-deserved and well-wrought and just incredibly well done. 
So of course there's the question of Nancy Bell and whether or not uh, she's going to get smarter about people she loves. But we also are really invested in Bruce and whether Bruce is going to sort of realize his own um, self-worth and if he's going to get a little more self-aware and if he's going to stop trying to be, um, you know, he puts on airs. We want to know if Bruce is going to stop putting on airs. Um, the Paleys are so interesting. So Christina Paley, I mean, the names are, every single name is so significant. The Paleys, you know, you can imagine them being very pale because they're just in, in such grief and they're living, they're sort of shadows of themselves. They're living with, a, like in the, you know, they're living sort of as a, as a shadow of themselves. They're living kind of in the pale of things. Um, but, and you also, it's Paul Paley. And so Paul is literally like throwing a pall over everything. I mean, they're really um, just very, very sad people. And then we have Christina, who is essentially this kind of Christ person. She is someone who is kind of resurrected and who is also um, providing resurrection for lots of characters in the novel. So I think, um, you know, it, it could be heavy handed, but uh, I would imagine that unless you're reading this book for like the third time and really thinking carefully about some of the religious motifs, but also about the names and about the structure and about the evolution of characters, it might have slipped past you. But I do think Christina can be read as this kind of Christ figure. So, you know, she lost her daughter, uh, you know, 23 years before. And when she meets Evangeline, who is about that same age, she sort of takes Evangeline under her wing, of course. And then as Evangeline's name changes, for example, she goes from being Evangeline, which we have to really associate with her father, the canon, who's this totally insufferable, cruel, awful man, um, who of course would name his daughter Evangeline because he's like an evangelist. But she becomes Angie, which is, um, you know, much more familiar and grounded and kind of like a more, you know, normal, kind of more modern name for 1957, but also is associated with the idea of angels, um, which you could argue is religious, but there's this idea of, of her becoming an angel, of, of sort of um, rising upward instead of just being this kind of evangelist person. Um, so not only does um, Christina sort of begin to adopt uh, uh, Evangeline, but she she does the same. Mrs. Paley also is adopting Jerry a little bit. Like she takes on um, the three Cove girls who are really so ill-treated by their own mother. So you have this real kind of catharsis in the sense that um, that Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Paley is, is, is really beginning her own healing by also helping all of these other people. So you have this incredible growth, not only of her, because it's so cathartic and so uh, healing to help other people, but also those other people are having their own, um, you know, kind of evolution. So again, we have to ask ourselves, so what? Like, so, okay, great. You know, you have these different character arcs. Yes, that is satisfying. But it's also important in the context of this amazing novel to recognize that that is um, even more upping our tension and our intrigue because you're getting more and more invested in these people. You really want things to work out well for the three little cove girls and you want it to work out well for Evangeline and for Jerry with all of his zits. You know, you really want the best for these people because they are growing and the whole time you're like, oh no, like what if they are really investing and really working hard and going through all of this catharsis only to be, um, you know, obliterated, only to perish in the hotel. So it's this incredible sense too of like futility and absurdity and of, you know, um, of lives being cut short when people are making incredible progress, of waste, of threat, of the fact that, you know, the human condition is such that we never know what is happening next. I mean, you know, we can do all we want for self-improvement, but we just, we never know what is coming, uh, coming down the pike. So there is this real sense that not only is it very satisfying, but it is even, um, you know, further ratcheting up this incredible tension. Okay, so... Now that we have covered the incredible structure, this collage-like structure that is unique and, and so powerful and so well done, we've talked about the narrative voice, we have talked about intrigue, we've talked about evolution, we are now going to look at the close of the novel. So I'm assuming that everyone um, who is listening has uh, finished the book. If you have not finished the book, um, you know, you probably want to do that because we, uh, at the very end of the book, are going to find out who the survivors are. 
So looking at the close of the novel, looking at this entire sort of last chapter is so gratifying. And so it's, it's, I, it's such a powerful and satisfying ending. It's unbelievable. So the last chapter of the book is called The Feast, which is, again, so satisfying because we have this kind of bookend thing happening. The title of the book obviously being The Feast and then this as kind of um, this culmination of the feast. And the title, um, I always mark a little mark um, and make a little note when the, the title comes up in the course of the novel. And it has come up many times. Um, the Gifford children, who are the ones who were kept in cotton wool in Massachusetts during the war and whose mother, Lady Gifford, because they have money, they're kind of brats and they're not great. Um, and they, um, you know, they, they haven't been through any of the trials and tribulations. They are very used to having feasts. But of course, the young Cove girls, whose mother is so awful, um, the, you know, their greatest hope is to one day have a feast. So, of course, some of the um, more good-hearted people in the book decide that they really want to make this feast come to fruition for the Cove girls, but also for, you know, the entire group. So um, toward the end of this book and at this point, uh, the feast is sort of underway, but so many um, different things have happened that the beginning of the feast is in fact not feeling very successful. So we are going to read on page 316. Supper had been delayed rather too long and the genial spirit of the feast had begun to fizzle out, though all maintain a dutiful pretense of enjoyment. Most of the guests had arrived in low spirits. Jerry and Evangeline were overtired and wanted to be alone together. Sir Henry's gloom was scarcely enlivened by the cricket on his nose. Um, they're in costume. I should have mentioned that. So some of these things are about their costumes. Mrs. Paley concealed a tearful face beneath her hat. Paul's contempt still had power to wound her. Caroline had been struggling with tears all the evening for Hebe, while they were dressing, had announced that she had done something dreadful and was to be sent away forever and ever. She would not say what it was, nor would she admit that she minded leaving them. So that Caroline was glad to hide her stricken face under the hood of a sheeted ghost, and Hebe made a very morose angel. So this is, um, it's so well done. It's so deft because we're having what is essentially kind of a roll call here. We're getting all of the names of all of these people as they are attending the feast. There are a few more people. Fred, Robin, and the twins and the three hostesses were genuinely happy. And Nancy Bell's sorrows were so deeply buried that nobody could have supposed she had any which is actually just sad. That's just really just sad. Um, but we have this sense of the feast as, as not really functioning super well yet. But in this beautiful chapter, which we can't look at the whole thing, um, you know, their spirits begin to lift and they begin to have this kind of sense of unity. And it's so beautiful um, that they, they really start to come together. There's um, some talking, there's serving food. The Cove girls, there's this incredible uh, description of the three of them. It says, the Coves were too happy to sing, too happy to eat. Gravely, they circled around the ring, offering food and drink to their guests. So they're so, so happy. But of course, the way that they show it, um, this is, again, um, it's not exactly dramatic irony, but it is this kind of insight. They, they look um, to, from the outside, they would look very morose, but they're so, so happy to be bringing uh, this feast to fruition. So then we have what is essentially the climax. This is just a couple of pages before the novel is over. So finally, um, we have the feast coming into full swing. Everybody sang, everybody shouted. They made such a noise that, for a few seconds, they hardly noticed the other noise which was going on until all sounds were swallowed up in one shattering, ear-splitting, jarring roar which threw them to the ground in darkness and terror. To some, it seemed that the noise went on for a long time, while others maintained, afterwards, that it was all over very quickly. Nor could, be sure that, nor could they be sure that they had not flung themselves down. But there they were lying, in a choking cloud of dust, while the noise subsided in a diminishing arpeggio of falling stones, skipping pebbles, the murmur of waves." 
It's such beautiful prose. So you have the idea, you know, at the height of all of their singing and their voices, um, you have this, this, um, this collapse, this gigantic noise that happens. And then we have at the end of the paragraph, this beautiful, um, there, there are a couple of uh, ellipses here, like dot, 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 um, where the noise is subsiding. And we as readers are hearing the noise subside in the prose in a way that is so well done. It's a diminishing arpeggio of falling stones, skipping pebbles, the murmur of waves. So it's so beautiful too because arpeggio and skipping pebbles, you have all that, p p like all that percussive noise because you have that plosive noise. But then we have the murmur of waves. So you have the M and the V and the waves, like you have th this kind of percussive noise then followed by this very calm murmur. It's so, it's so beautiful. Um, so then, so then we're going to look at the, at the very end of the novel here. Certainly remind, you are certainly reminded of the war at this point. Um, at one, they, they think it's the atomic bomb. So, um, you know, you have this very strong sense here of the war as, as hanging over all of them. On the very final page, we have this. But they could not understand it and still half believed that some kind of enemy had attacked them, for they were accustomed to associate such violent events with an act of man rather than of God. Stunned and terrified, they huddled together in a thinning haze of dust until they saw a gleam of moonlight on the sea and placid waves falling upon a beach, a familiar sight which might have reassured them had it been a beach that they had ever seen before. So this is incredible. This is the first paragraph on this last page here. The act of God, I did a lot of thinking about Margaret Kennedy. Um, I, I don't know how religious she was and religion certainly um, you know, plays a, a large part throughout the novel, but, but I have a sense um, that you know, it's fairly agnostic for lack of a better word. Um, she doesn't seem to sort of come down one way or the other. It's not like an anti-Catholic book or a super anti, I mean, it's just, it's sort of, not it's kind of anti-clerical altogether but I think when she's using act of God here it's mostly just in the sense of of, of nature and yes uh, you know I think God you know is important here and and um, you know you can't discount that but really I think what she's emphasizing is that these people are so used to um, you know man-made catastrophes after the you know gigantic world wars that they have just all been through that it's hard to imagine that something um, is caused by an act of God. Importantly, however, this is not, it's not so much an act of God. This a landmine had um, gone into a cave in the cove and had exploded like a year before. And so um, it was in fact the landmine that is ultimately responsible for this thing happening. So on some level, you know, a, a careful reader is going to remember that this is in fact an act of man. This is a direct result of the Second World War. Jerry and Sir Henry were the first to guess, but they said nothing. In silence, they watched the pall of dust subside. As the truth leapt from mind to mind, a moaning sigh went through the group. They drew closer together as if still clinging to that frail, that transient unity which had so strangely assembled and preserved them. It's so beautiful, this transient unity that has had brought them together and, and saved them. They're beginning to understand it is dawning on them that because of the feast, they have all been saved. Nobody spoke until one of the Gifford twins, raising his head from the bosom of Nancy Bell, looked out upon the scene below and asked wonderingly, who did it? I mean, that is a big question, and I would love to spend more time thinking about it. I mean, I, I think the answer is that there isn't really, you, there isn't a sense of like anyone being responsible, which is, you know, one of these sort of very large human uh, realities. This is a relatively young child who is asking this question. I mean, yes, there is the answer that the, the mine, you know, that, that the mine bomb that exploded is in part responsible, but in fact, there is not an answer to his question. There was a shout from the hill behind. Little figures appeared on the skyline. People were running down from the village and from the farms. The group on the headland stirred and broke up. They whispered together, giving a name to what had happened. Already, it was traveling into the past. Their thoughts turned towards the future. 
such beautiful prose. So um, we have here, people came running down. So people are coming down and we have this group who is having kind of literally their like last gasp of as being a group together. The group on the headlands stirred and broke up. They whispered together, giving a name to what had happened. Um, I don't actually know. I mean, it's so funny. I don't know what that is. They're giving a name. I mean, is it landslide? Is it catastrophe? Is it disaster? Is it obliterated? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, it's very interesting given that we have so much, you know, th th most of this text is so incredibly revealing and forthcoming. Um, it's nice on some level that, that she's maybe keeping a little something, something back. Um, but this idea of naming it is forcing it to already recede into the past. Giving a name to what had happened, already it was traveling into the past. Their thoughts turned toward the future. We'd better go up to the village, said Jerry, to the vicarage. Father Bot will take us in. Which is also beautiful because we are, we're moving full circle. It's very satisfying. You know, the, the prologue is where Father Bot is about to hear all of these astonishing things that these people are about to tell him. Um, but, but in, and we know that's about to happen, but, but we have this one last sentence, which is just absolutely gorgeous. And they moved off in a straggling procession, taking up once more the burden of their 16 separate lives. It's so gorgeous. It's just, it's such an incredible literary feat. This book is just, it just speaks to me so, so deeply. Um, the straggling procession, you know, you would process, you know, out of church. It's a very sort of um, like liturgical kind of um, ecclesiastical kind of thing that's happening here. But they're a straggling procession, um, it, taking up once more the burden of their lives. They had this moment together at, at this feast, this moment of unity, this transient sense of unity. And, and now they are having to take up again the burden of their lives. So it's actually a very dark note that she ends on and I'm so happy about that because the book is so funny and so gorgeous and so insightful and in lots of ways is so wry and kind of um, intelligent and tongue-in-cheek that it really is very satisfying uh, to, to end on, on, on what is kind of a bleak note. And again, I would remind you, um, Margaret Kennedy is a British woman who is writing, uh, you know, in 1950 about uh, essentially in, in lots of ways, the aftermath of the Second World War and all of the changes that are happening in England. So it seems very apt to me uh, that, that we might end uh, on a little bit of a dark note. Speaking of endings, I want to stop there. Thank you so much for hanging in during this uh, relatively uh, intense discussion of this book. I really feel like this book deserves intense discussion because it is so, so good. I also hope that you uh, head back to the Fox page, find something else that interests you. And as always, I wish you happy reading.